get back on your way. So I'm going to invite folks to maybe just put pause to the exciting conversations that they are clearly having. Um, I know tonight probably has generated a lot of different ideas. because we're trying to gather people's energy back together for the discussion. And um, the first question that we wanted to pose to the community present tonight was, what are some of the common themes and threads that you heard in the stories that were shared tonight by our panel? And anyone who has some reflections on what those might be? Yeah. Build your support network. Because without it, you're going nowhere. And, it, and the panelists are also welcome to answer these questions, but we are going to throw it first out to the community. Um, I, I agree with that. And one of the things that we did in the and one of the things we were at that but was that we were building the support on the support network on two fronts. One was the kind of community outside the doors. And the other was, through the volunteers, that community. And so that community really held things together. Um, and then the other community came and went, but in a, when you were pushed, that outside community came through for us. So what are some of the other linking stories that we heard coming out, themes that seem kind of persistent through the different um, stories that we heard tonight. Uh, you all saw a need and you fixed it. Problem. It wasn't mentioned, but I'm sure negotiating how you keep involved in feeling not burnt out is a constant um, part of the work. Someone in the back of the room now. I was just going to say, like, the physical space, to me, and going back to the theme, is really important because as much as all my activism um, has its place, I think the physical space is what brings people together, and that's so powerful. Oh, you didn't hear. So the, the very fact of physical space. Totally. Bringing people together. Right back there. Struggle to keep the spaces open. And the, and the sacrifice of a lot of people who are very close to the project end up making, which is their giving. But it's also like a sacrifice as well. I think that the, the comment about a support base and the, the importance of real physical community and a real physical space really reinforce each other because people just stumble upon your space and see what's going on there and they get involved in ways that are so, just so powerful because they're real and, and physical and you stumble on things that you wouldn't otherwise find. Like when you, you, know, you don't have to go looking for it, you don't have to know it's there. It's like a library, you can find something that you had no idea about. And that, I think, really built a broad, broad support base. Any other common threads, please, Em? Self-determination and uh, community determination of roles and how the space is laid out and accessibility. Remembering why you're doing it. Okay. Maybe we'll move on to the second question. Oh, yeah. The remembering why you're doing it is kind of interesting because um, when, uh, when we started the camp, we had very clear reasons why we were doing it, but at some point, 
I got really interested in being able to make a cappuccino. And, you know, I thought, I've got really good skills here. I could probably get a job. And, so I think that what happens is that you come in for one reason, and if you're open, you might yeah. get other things happen. I'm going to invite Rich to say one more thing. Just building on what Anna said about a, a space that's self-organized. That's something that we notice a lot in our store, especially when new volunteers come in, is that there's no boss and there's no set of rules about how you're supposed to do stuff. And it's a space where you're, we live so much of our lives with an authority figure telling us what to do, where to go, when to be there, who to be responsible to, and for what, and under what circumstances. And a space where all of that is much less present is so powerful in terms of realizing your capacity to think for yourself and do for yourself, both as an individual and as a community. And a, a physical space makes that happen so much more so because you can, with your collective power, get out of the sort of hierarchical way that we're used to being organized and into a space where we're more free of that. I think a. <laughs> Well, I, just, I, just wait. I was just going to build on that in that like physical space, yes, it's, it, give, it grants that, uh, that space for people to, to grow, but also um, common thread uh, in, in all that is everyone that's there takes it with them. So as said before, it's not just about that space, it's everywhere, it's within you, because you take it with you from growing within you. I think linking up is, is good because uh, we learn how to do alliance work and, and build that alliance work. But we have, we're, we're also faced with so many challenges. As a political you know, organization, it's not easy to, for example, find money <laughs> to, to fund our, our spaces. So it is really important that uh, for people within the left circle have to really realize that we need these spaces for us to talk about our issues. And I think this was the, uh, the reason why, even though we were so um, tight with our money, our, our community is so poor, um, we're able to um, organize the women to find ways and means we did our catering, um, not just catering, but it's also political. We know that at the end of our table, we have our flyers, we have, you know, some uh, petitions for people to sign up. So it was really very uh, um, motivating and, and encouraging for a lot of our volunteers. And uh, I, I also have to say that uh, volunteering needs to be also politicized. We cannot just continue to call people to come and do the work, um, you know, because they're run away if there if there is no political decision that is happening. Um, so I'm really proud to say that the Kalayan Center um, had uh, had an, an well always be producing so many you know, activists. We have touched a lot of uh, our, our women's uh, lives. They haven't, they didn't know uh, uh, what women's equality is all about when they first came to the center. So these are really, uh, and they feel safe coming to the center. We've had so many um, queer members who have come out because of the center, they feel free to talk about their issues. So I think this is something that's really very important for us. Uh, it's still not happening how we can actually support one another. And this is something that is very common in the left. We, we have become quite sectarian among each other. And uh, the, only, um, the only groups that they really know where they're going are the ruling class. So if we if we are going to learn how to um, to unite with with our own classes, I think we'll be able to move forward 
uh, in, in, in a big way. But I think that's something that we need all to learn, uh, being in the left. Because until now, the left is still not united despite the, the things that we've seen um, you know, in Europe, even here in Canada. I mean, you know, Harper is still, you know, three times winner in the election. And what are we going to, what are we doing as left? You know, we're not there, we're losing jobs and, you know, so many things happening in this country and uh, healthcare is in crisis. You know, it's, it's time for us to come together and say here, you know, we have to move forward as left movement. We need to reconceptualize, we need to regroup, we need to talk about our issues. There are two more comments that wanted to be made about this um, question, so I'm going to send it to the back, and then I'm going to send it to Anna, and then we're going to move on. Uh, just really quickly, uh, in the case of Occupy, I thought it was really interesting that they were highly criticized because they were associated with Tent City, and now that the Tent City has been dismantled, mm -hmm. they are saying, oh, well, and I've been told, well, Occupy makes you sure it's over, because they're not occupying mm -hmm. physical space, and obviously that's not the case, but they Every night, but it, for people to think that it's over because they have they aren't taking that space for which they were criticized and has like now the um, and also I guess just moving forward and choosing the appropriate space in terms of the occupying within the city and being visible and where you're allowed to be and whether being paid yeah have a space or And just a theme that I noticed tonight is uh, sharing stories, partnering with each other, celebrating histories, and listening and learning, listening to and learning from our elders, the people who have gone before us, and have so much wisdom. And uh, I just I can't say it enough. Thank you. Thank you so much. So we have a plant in the audience who was given a question earlier, Linda, Virginia. and I'm going to ask her if she'd be willing to read that question out loud now for us to deal with as a community. Thank you, Linda. Sure. What is the role of having a radical space for organizing in the context of intensifying gentrification in Vancouver? Did everyone hear that? So what is the role of... Having a, radical having a radical space for organizing. for organizing in the context of increasing gentrification in the city of Vancouver. So what is the role of having radical spaces for organizing in the face of gentrification? Well, I was just going to say, I, I'm a little dismayed by the we did lose some of our strongest advocates on council who were very much uh, addressing or trying to address some of these issues. So I think, I don't know if we need to really put that pressure on the municipal government. Obviously, there are so many other levels involved um, in uh, land and property and larger forces at play. But I, I, I would open up to anyone who has who's been thinking about this because I really concerned about where things are going with them. So in the context of vision and uh, whether this is actually going to get to where we need to be or when we have some education, I would say it's not. I'm going to invite folks who are in the back over there and folks who are way over here to really shout as much as possible because uh, they know it's hard to yeah, hear sorry. and it's then hard to repeat it. Yeah. I saw another hand back there, I think, are we? Uh, I would say uh, that gentrification isn't just uh, a thing that happens and then, then you lose the neighborhood. Gentrification is also a process of restructuring neighborhoods. So our project W2 strategically chose a very gentrified, very problematic site, which is the Rubens development, and worked uh, many years to fight as a radical project using a Trojan horse strategy to secure that space so that we have a 20-year future as a radical space. Um, and we do 
that using parallel infrastructure model, which is all about being self-financed. We sell beer and we sell coffee. That's how we pay our bills. So we're 93% self-funded. And um, so those are strategies I think that are, I think we, we need to look as a community, as Cecilia said, uh, we have to work against sectarianism. We get a lot of shit talk because the people is in a gentrified spot. Uh, but I think when we look at the myriad of types of spaces, we have to look at different models and that there's strength in those different models and there's also strength in the alliance work that we do. Um, I've, I've experienced with five out of the six spaces that are on the panel uh, over the last 25 years. And I think we all learn from those models and these are very, very difficult neoliberal times. Gentrification is just like something that's happening in the downtown side is happening to our neoliberalism. Aggressive free market capitalism is happening in all sectors of life. So we need all variety of models. We need all the variety of uh, lessons from these spaces. Like Lacana shut down because the revolutionaries that were running it they didn't want to serve coffee to them. They had their higher priorities on political work. But there's different models, and we have to learn from those models and think about 10, 20 years from now, how are we actually going to survive as a resistance? I wanted to say something. I'm not sure what um, uh, Jean was going to say about Carnegie, but part of it is that Carnegie has an organizing group um, that is a project of the board of Carnegie. So the board of Carnegie is quite progressive, and um, if any of you have worked at Carnegie, I've worked at Carnegie years ago, um, and if any of you have been there or worked at it, you'll see there's kind of a trench mentality there, like where it's us against the world. And um, so the board is quite happy to allow um, groups to come in and use the space to organize whatever events. And I think that, that those uh, community centers are places that we don't think of much where we could actually use those spaces to, uh, to organize things. And the other thing I wanted to say, and this isn't about Carnegie, but um, I, I work with a seniors group now, uh, um, the Council of Senior Citizens, and it's quite a progressive group. But one of the things that 87-year-old old-timer told me at one point was that all of her friends were having to leave the east side of Vancouver, not the downtown east side, the east side of Vancouver, because they were old and they couldn't afford to live there anymore. So they were all having to move to Surrey or wherever. Um, and it was very difficult for transportation and very lonely for them. So that in their, in their senior years, they in fact were losing their communities. That's an area that I think um, young people need to make alliances with older people who are losing their, their homes and losing um, you know, their rental spaces or whatever they're doing. Sarah. Alternative uh, models and what Linda was saying about using community spaces. <clears throat> it's an impact of gentrification at large in our world is that those who would already be uh, in line with us around community space and uh, might have resources available, they're being squeezed also. You know, the, the funding for things like community centers and um, all of that stuff where. I think we have all at some point looked for, for support and space. I work in a, in a public library. We have very tiny space that's just used to the max, and it's free. But there's so much competing um, for the little space that there is, and gentrification would just bring a greater um, squeeze on that. And so that's why we need the, the spectrum of movements, including unoccupied demand our right to the space. Thank you. Yes. Um, I think um, I think um, part of the importance of having this radical space and having any more spaces, like we talked about um, with with like the Alliance and Jerry and with Hannah, all of these things they all came from from a group of people who had these issues. And, and needed the space to have it. And as as it grew, you can see how the space had really grown to reflect the issues of the community, the values of the community, the values of the members. And 
and seeing it grow is it's, it's really a symbol of, of the movement that's going on. And, and us being moved out and us losing the space, it's, it's, you know, it's also, it just shows even more like how much more pressure there is to, to us to, to really keep the space and, and really work for it. Um, yeah, it's really like a symbolism of, of the work that we do, of the movement that we have. to create these spaces. Um, I mean, first of all, it's difficult. It can be difficult to like, get funding in, a, in neighborhoods that are increasingly gentrified. Once we're there, how do we hold that space and not actually contribute to the gentrification? Um, so it's not something that, uh, I've, or that I think anybody has the answer to, but it's just something to keep in mind um, when choosing a neighborhood to, to move into with a radical space, like what what are you bringing to that neighborhood that's not necessarily positive? Coming from a cooperative community, cooperative farm project up in the interior, um, where you know any part of a radical revolution has to be based around finding home, growing food. Um, from that perspective, in terms of how we can. Uh, move in a, in a more comprehensive way in our urban centers and our neighborhoods. I think you know the Occupy movement and the other radical spaces that we need to start really working on in our communities. I was really uh, it is in each of our neighborhoods where we live, where we can grow food, where we can you know look after our communities and be strong and resist the kind of gentrification, the kind of in our rural areas the you know, massive resource, you know, corporate resource exploitation. The only places where I've seen those, that resistance to be able to withhold those kinds of pressures is when there is really strong, you know, uh, community. Um, one of the examples uh, or uh, inspirations that over the last year that I've been following a lot is in Portland. Um, City Repair, a really, really amazing organization that has, at a neighborhood level, uh, worked with other organizations in the neighborhood. But to really develop these neighborhood by neighborhood um, um, community consensus democracy uh, models, uh, where you know they start with intersection interventions, where they, you know, basically, you know, come up with a community intersection that they designate their meeting place. They paint a mandala that you know they develop themselves, and then go and grow from there in terms of you know cob, bu covered bus shelters and you know community bake ovens and solar uh, showers and saunas. So you know that's the big. I, I you know I think the really from my experience of being able to resist the kinds of things uh, rap communities need to uh, pursue is you. Is to develop at where we live and where we grow food, where we can support the kind of uh, radicalism we need. We're going to take three more comments on this one. So, one right here, and then I think there are two from the panel. Yeah. Um, something occurs to me as as the public, we collectively own in public trust a set of huge buildings bigger than libraries, bigger than community centers, with huge gymnasiums, tons of rooms. They're all heated 24 hours a day, usually, and they're all empty all but six hours of the day. I'm talking, of course, about schools. And in East Vancouver, there are five almost empty ones 
which the Vancouver School Board considered closing last year in a relatively unpopular decision. I have no idea what it would look like. It would be fascinating to occupy part of the school. Well. Thanks. <coughs> now we'll take it to our panelists. <clears throat> That's a really good point. And, uh, <laughs> And that's the power of occupation as a tactic, in the sense that it can be replicated by anyone, at any time, in any place. And that's why you see this a coordinated action, both in Canada and in the US, to shut it down by the municipal governments, which, and I'm sure, by the, and, and the provincial ones as well. Christy Clark and the recent liberals try to get a blanket injunction yeah. to prevent us from setting up, from occupying any space, essentially to criminalize a peaceful, mo a peaceful movement for social change. And so the question becomes, once you start criminalizing peaceful activities, what else is left? And this is the reality of our situation. Occupying a public space has been met with such inherent violence mm -hmm. under the pretext of safety concerns it's an abomination. And like, why shouldn't we take over these spaces that have been abandoned and, and worry about certain bylaws or, or, or getting arrested? Like, this is their only threat. If all of the people in this room, and maybe a hundred more people, went, went, you know, took over a little mountain neighborhood house or whatever, has been shut down, that's a powerful statement. And I firmly believe that the reason they don't want us to do this is because when you occupy a space, it signifies continuity. It signifies a sort of setting up roots in a space. And they don't want that to happen because they realize that tactic is so powerful. They would rather shut it down and have all the threats that the state does. You know, we'll put you in prison, fine you $10,000, 12 months, all this stuff. Injunction, it's bad, bad. Don't go there, folks. And it's how long do we have to wait for things to get so bad for us to resort to a tactic that is essentially extremely peaceful, mm -hmm. is my question. Why are we waiting for them to criminalize this, you know? So thank you for pointing that out. I don't know if I can follow that, but um, <laughs> in terms of the, the point about the danger of radical spaces being used as the thin edge of the wedge of gentrification, I think it's really important for us to be aware of that. That's something we talked about in Spartacus a lot especially since we were priced out of the block where we've been for 35 years to a new place further east that's in a neighborhood that is rapidly gentrifying as well. And we look at what are the ways that we can occupy the space to do what we've always done as a collective and do that in a way that makes a statement about having solidarity with and recognizing that there's a community already there that we want to respect instead of coming in as if there is no community there, as if we have all the answers with that colonizer mentality, right? That's what gentrification is, right? It's another kind of colonizer mentality, right? There's nothing here. I know what this place needs. I'm going to change this for the better, blah, 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 right? So some of the things that we've done in our collective to really directly kind of make a statement about that are things like having our space be somewhere where anyone can come and use our bathroom. We're in a neighborhood where there's nowhere to go to the bathroom. How inhuman is that? Right? People can come in and use our bathroom. That's so much of what people do in our space. They come in and use our phone. Right? We set up a phone outside of our store that's there 24 hours a day for people to use for free because there's no phones in the neighborhood. Yeah. Right? You can't even call 911. And if you do, they're not even going to come because they know what neighborhood you're calling from. Right? So we did things like that within our collective to recognize that it would be really easy for our space to get used to further things that are the opposite of what we want. And so understanding how to stand in solidarity and like really concrete, simple ways, like how big a deal is it to put a phone outside and keep it running? Like it takes some of our energy and we do stuff and it's surprising how much energy it does take, but it's, it's really concrete things that we can do to point out how inhuman it is that you can't go to the bathroom, that you, you can't, you're expected to have a cell phone, you can't sleep, right? You can't sit still without buying something. That's ridiculous, right? And so 
having a space where someone can come and sit all day, pick up a book, read the whole thing cover to cover, put it back on the shelf and leave again without being hassled to buy it is super, super important in terms of making our spaces something that can occupy a space without gender. It's, it's possible, but we need to think really carefully and make a conscious, concrete stand to do that and to be against it. I see Cecilia has one last comment that she wants to make on this question, and then I'm going to hand it over to Lisa for our last question. This is something funny, right? I just remember it because you're, you're talking about there's even no space to use the toilet there's, because there's no toilet. Uh, a few years ago, when I went to uh, the Netherlands to attend this international conference, we've always been wondering because every time we go from one street to the next street, there's a urinal. Okay? There's a urinal. So that men can go and use the urinal. But there is no urinal for women. Okay? So one day, I don't know if we are all willing to do that. Maybe we can go out there right now. <laughs> but it's true, hey? That's, that's women did this. Okay? Because there's urinal every time we go. Because, the, you know, it's just a half circle like that. Men get into that urinal and they pee, but no urinal for women. So the Dutch women, they were so radical and went out to the streets one day. They organized among themselves. And at one time, I think it was 4 o'clock in the afternoon, the streets were full of women and they peed in the street. So, the challenge is, I think we're just too modest to do this. <laughs> Are you up to the challenge? <laughs> because there's no toilet, and that's a reality. And it is going to send a big message to the city hall of Vancouver that we need more toilets in the city of Vancouver. And I think it's so nice to do this during the summer times, <laughs> when we have a lot of tourists, <laughs> and just do this one afternoon. I oh bet you, they'll be putting toilets. <laughs> this will be my last, you know. Really. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Occupy with urine. Yeah. 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 Marcia had one last comment that she wanted to make on this question, and then we're going to hand it over to Lisa. Thank you. I just want to first acknowledge that we're here on unceded Coast Salish territory, the land of the Musqueam, Swale of Tooth, and Squamish people. Um, I just had a, a comment on gentrification. I organize and work in the downtown east side. Um, and in terms of this idea of how radicals or radical spaces can avoid being part of gentrification and avoid being complicit in it. And I think I just really want to stress that people have to become active in the fight against gentrification. And this isn't an abstract theoretical debate about you know how do we avoid complicity. There are really active struggles against gentrification happening in the downtown east side. And I'd really encourage artists, particularly because artists, artists, as someone said, kind of the foot soldiers of gentrification, we see that quite starkly in the downtown east side. Um, we're surrounded by art studios, wine and cheese nights, totally inaccessible spaces for downtown east side residents. And there is a growing campaign under the banner of downtown east side, not for developers. Um, and next week there's um, an Occupy Condos action, which is to take back the Pantages. People haven't, haven't heard Pantages is the old Pantages theater where Mark Williams is trying to build condos. Um, again, he's trying to draw on the support of artists. There's a lot of artists who are endorsing his campaign. There's also a lot of artists who are standing up and saying, we won't be complicit, we won't participate, we don't care if we get free rent. That free rent isn't a blank check to gentrify the neighborhood. You can't become kind of a Trojan into these kinds of projects. Um, and that are saying no to gentrification on that basis. And so for people who are kind of wondering about how to balance that, um, I really encourage people to get active in that campaign and to really join the neighborhood because as people have said, this is not a terra nullius. There's people who reside there, there's people who need support, people who need solidarity, 
there's an action on Tuesday, and we're going to be occupying Pantages. Um, and occupation is a tactic. It's a really important tactic to reclaim space, to reclaim space in the context of the downtown east side for 100%, not only social housing, but resident-controlled social housing, because we're seeing a lot of nonprofits really become embedded in a structure of social control. Um, and so this is a really important action, and I'd encourage people to come out at 4 o'clock and really take back space from the developers, because in, the, in Vancouver, real estate developers and real estate speculation really are the 1%, right? This idea of who are the 1% who hold political and economic power. They're real estate developers who are looking in the downtown east side to develop kind of the last bastion of cheap real estate, and they're selling it particularly to working people and to really setting up working people against the downtown east side community because they're pitching it as affordable home entry ownership. And it's really important for artists and um, non-housing or, or uh, non-profit social housing providers as well as working people to say, we're gonna boycott condos in the downtown east side until no one is homeless, no one is in SROs, and no one is in shelters. Um, and that's a really clear demand and that really applies to all of us who want to stand in support of that neighborhood. And so I'd really encourage people to come out on Tuesday. That was both kind of a comment and a pitch, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you all so much for this. And I want to I want to bring us back to where we started um, this evening. And and for me as I as I think about having this panel and having this discussion as part of Rhizome's fifth anniversary celebrations, there's so many things that I've heard that really resonate with me and that are such a direct reflection of our experiences in starting this space and struggling to maintain this space and, and fighting to live a vision while existing in a society that is structured in a fundamentally oppositional way to everything that we believe in and, and trying to project those visions while also trying to pay the rent and trying to pay the bills. Um, but I've been really, really inspired by all of these examples of how staying true and remembering why you started something is a very powerful act. And while recognizing that those reasons can change and evolve, um, I think one thing that, that really resonates also is that there have been moments of crisis that lead to tremendous creativity. And I, I feel for us, in this moment in our development, you know, six months ago, we put out a call to the community and said, this space will not continue to exist if, if it doesn't, if something doesn't change. And we have been building a network and reaching out and asking for support. And that, that kind of crisis has led to collaborations and growth and creativity that is just beyond anything that we could have imagined. And I've, I've heard similar stories here and, and take a tremendous amount of strength from that. Um, so for us, as we think about moving into the next stage of Rhizome, recommitting to making this an accessible space, recommitting to holding this space for radical work to happen, recommitting to recognizing each other's humanity and realizing that seeing each other, I think, is in and of itself a very radical act, as has been said, that seeing each other as more than a financial transaction, as something that transcends a financial transaction, as something that erases a financial transaction, that is a radical act. Um, so my question for all of you is, what do you think that Rhizome can learn from all that we have heard? Um, I'm, I really, really want to, and I, you know, I'm scribbling down all these things that I'm learning as I'm hearing all of this, um, but what can Rhizome do to support the continued existence of our, our network, our growing Rhizome of spaces? How can we better carry on the legacy of spaces that came before us? Um, what are lessons that the panelists want to offer us? What are lessons that any of you think can help us do that work better? made me think about, well, what has made the OC successful? We just celebrated our five years in the Fraser Broadway area, and um, I think one of the lessons that I've learned as an organizer is really 
the work that comes out of the OC is what keeps us there. Um, people in the neighborhood are knowing more and more about the work we do um, just by walking by and seeing the posters that are, that are hanging on our window even though we're open every day. And also opening up the space for community discussion groups like the Red Flags, um, having the movie nights and having a discussion about the movie after that. So really connecting with the people that you're, connecting with the community that you're in and, and doing that. That's a lesson for me. I think that's something that we at the Alliance Center are really thinking. Um, we uh, we have a vision of putting up several you know floors so that we can use this space for different things like health center. We have so many Filipino women who are here and are not practicing their their nursing their skills. So that's something that the community can. Uh, can use and utilize and uh, yeah so the space is there and we really would like to campaign maybe uh, next year um, uh, so that we can we can build the space uh, we're able to get uh, volunteers not just the people who are there every day but some of the strategies that we have used at the Kalayan Center is not to celebrate Christmas and to bring gifts, right? If, and if they do, if they have to bring gifts to the client center, meaning the things that we use every day. So that's some of the things that we that we do so that we can survive. It's uh, like the labor, uh, electrician, plumbers, uh, carpenters, so we can call on them if we have things to be fixed. So it, it's really mobilizing the community rather than just you know, uh, volunteers or group of people. So it's 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 a very um, uh, you think it's it's traditional, but it is it's very um, uh, important for us to think that there is a collective and there's work to be done. You know, in order for us to do our political work. I was just really when when I came back, um, I saw Oppenheimer Park. It's now beautiful. Right, they, they they put up new, you know, um, benches and, and everything. And I said, what's happening here? Because I was away now, been away for like six years, and we know that gentrification is coming to the downtown east side. And I remember we were choked when I saw Starbucks at the very end of Denver, and and Powell. I saw and I, I, I knew that the, the, the gentrification is coming on our side, in you know, a part of downtown east side. And then, um, um, even before that, when we approached the city of Vancouver, uh, we were told by the, by, by the bureaucrats that uh, you cannot have your center here because it's not safe for you. It's not safe for your women. And I said, hey, I know where I come from. <laughs> and I think there's really you no know, safe spaces for us. So I said, if that is your concern, no. That's your concern, <laughs> not our concern. So we want to stay and we want to build our center here. 
and we did. And Vancouver is still supporting us. I mean, really, and that's, I think, something that we need to push to make them understand that we're not leaving and uh, that the space is important for us. And as marginalized community, we need it. I said, you are using our skills and talents and, and we're just asking compensation. So I think it's really important to continue to do that. It's very symbolic, the 451 power, and we don't want to lose that space. We don't want to lose that. Everyone um, is welcome. Everyone was welcome during that time when we had the space. Everybody comes. You know, if you don't have any space for your meeting, come. Filipinos and non-Filipinos. So, you know, it's it's something that we, as uh, I think the left group, we need to continue to support. I know you're supporting us, your friends in the Philippines. And um, yeah, so I think it's it's nice. I think it's that there is still this something remaining in Vancouver that we need to think about. I started my um, activism really here in Vancouver, and uh, that's something I cannot, you know, see the things, you know, going for the communities. We need to fight. Need to fight Lakina and Jin Swanson and all these people before it was so much fun, you know, marching in the city of Vancouver. We have to bring that back. Speaking of bringing it back, so just to repeat Lisa's question, um, how can Rhizome support and learn from other radical spaces? So, what are some of the most salient lessons that we want to take out of tonight and kind of ensure that Rhizome leaves with? And that can also be experiences that you have from your own work that haven't been mentioned here tonight. I think one really important thing, which is really one really important thing, which is really obvious, is that it just stays open because it's already a hub for so many people already. People know that this is a good place to come. So just by staying open, it's a statement there. Like just by holding the state and making sure you come by, and drink coffee, and stay here. You're keeping the space open so it can have connections with other people. So it's kind of seems stupid to say, but it's a really good place to start. Um, something that I think of, like a lot of women here have spoken about, and it and it seems like Rizal does in so many of its events is really reach out to diverse different groups and act as a connector. And I guess what I would say is that that seems to be such a huge strength. Um, and I would encourage to. Also reach out to groups that aren't necessarily overtly politicized because I think that coming here provides a whole awareness of ways that people can get involved um, and who might not have that label of like the left or radical or whatever, but I think it speaks to the idea that there's a lot of fracturing amongst people who actually have really common values. So I don't know if I just follow up on uh, what can raise on Cafe do uh, to at the stage. I think, um, let's face it, we are at war. I mean, let's, let's, let's not mince any words here. I mean, they have been doing it to us. We, we back 20 years ago, there were several community groups. Where are they right now? I remember in 1992, there was a group downtown, they called themselves um, it's, 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 it's a collision of several community organizations right here in the Philippine Society. And right now, looking back, only the Philippine Women's Center or the Kalayan Center is left of those different community organizations. So the whole question, even Lakina was there, the whole question right now is, yes, we can always do battle, but how do we sustain it? And this is where we have to ask Raison Cafe, can we sustain it in another next five years? If we don't have that vision, because right now we're talking about tactics, and tactics is an everyday thing, that we have that vision, because the enemies out there, they have a long-term vision. You have this whole globalization thing, and it's coming to us. This is simply, and what we are experiencing here, is simply a local expression of that we call neoliberal globalization of the states. But we are responding on a tactical basis on a day-to-day. -day. If we don't have that long-term vision, then we're not going to win. Because this is a lifetime, a long-term protracted struggle. 
I mean, when we, when we, when we started out the, the Kalayan Center way back 20 years ago, we know that it's not going to stay on the Vancouver. There's Filipinos all over Canada and it's growing. We started out as a support and solidarity movement for the Philippines. Over a period of time, we said, no, the struggle is right here in Canada. So we started, no, we are going to stay here in Canada. We are part of this society. We are part of this polity and the struggle is right here. So while we continue to our support and solidarity movement, we concentrated that we are part of the revolutionary movement here and this is where our struggle is. We have that vision and we continue with that. So we started organizing in Toronto, we started organizing in Montreal, and we have those groups right now. We have become a national organization. Cecilia is dead of the National Alliance of Philippine Union in Canada, and we have just launched the uh, Congress. Congress of Filipino Canadians. Because we see that this is going to be a lifetime struggle. Five years from now, where will we be? Where will, we be? Where will most of us be? We'll be looking for jobs in this particular society under this same system and will be eaten by the system. So the thing is, do we have that vision? Because we're talking here about tactics. We have been into this movement, I've been here since 1978, and I have seen the left movement. We do the same thing, we repeat it almost, because after a certain period we lost. Then the next generation takes over, they do the same thing. You now this Occupy movement is very, very creative. We know that, they're offering something new. But some of these things have been done in the past. Let's not, let's not care of ourselves. The enemy is right there. Every day it is planning. Every day it is coming up. The gentrification was not done only a couple of years ago. It's been there because that's how the whole system operates. So we can say, let's have to start, let's start having that long term vision for ourselves as well. So Raisin Cafe, what could, could exist? It might have been exist for five years. Lakina uh, was able to survive for 18 years. Then it passed on over until the new generation has taken over. I mean, we're, my, uh, Cecilia and I had been involved here. We came to Canada when we, when we were really little bit younger. We write plans right away, and we have seen. People were telling me in the 1980s, the bottom of the barrel has not been reached by the crisis of the left. We still haven't seen it. We still are not sure if we have reached the bottom of the barrel. When are we going to get out? And we always say, let's start having that vision. And to me, that vision was we're diverse, as what was mentioned here. We have so many visions, but we have one common denominator here. We're all in this for something new that we wanted to see. And the something new is we start this dialogue and all that, and let's keep the rise of coffee open, but you know, let's get rid of what we say, our sectarianism of the past, but then let's learn the lesson of the past as well, because I think the past has so much, it has so much to teach us, so that we don't repeat the past, the errors of the past, but we can learn the successes of the past and bring it into the future. That's all I can say. Thank you. Um, we'll take, I think, maybe three more comments total for the night. So Denise, Peter, and then Jasmine. Thanks everyone for tonight. Um, that's a many generation bank for rights social activist. I'm hearing things that I've heard for decades. There's half a dozen organizations paying individual rent. Why don't we collectively get a space that rezone does the kitchen in collaboration with others? Why don't we petition the Vancouver City Hall to give a space at the Olympic Village, the place that is uh, available? And actually, this suggestion came from the person I go to for physiotherapy. Wouldn't it be a great legacy for Vancouver to give over this albatross that's a great uh, environmentally sustainable place called the Olympic Village to all the homeless people and social activists for a better future. I say collectively, let's work together and take over that space. Uh, just a quick comment, and I'm sure that, uh, that Brian's on the staff and, and, uh, and, and Lisa I thought at some point or another, but uh, it brought to mind when one of the panelists talked about the movie The Pig, where uh, workers whose factories were shutting down in Argentina cooperatized uh, it. And there are other businesses I looked at in school where they uh, opened up to pro ownership as a cooperative. And, and so it, it's obviously very sticky, and it and obviously doesn't work everywhere. But um, in terms of a long-term model, 
uh, or um, being the, the democratic and economic justice organizations we want to see in the future. Like, uh, it's also a great way to share the risk. <laughs> but it's not just you as the owners of, of the business. Oh, it's, it's your workers too. So I don't know. Obviously, it's not my business. Not my business. But, yeah. Yeah, to Rising Cafe. Um, I'm not that old, but I've been following you since the inception. And thank you so much for providing so many community organizations with this type of and truly from the bottom of all of our hearts. It does make a difference, and we really do appreciate all of your hard work. And the logic of, you know, the logic of capitalism <clears throat> is really brutal, you know? And, you know, Vancouver is the second most expensive city in North America. It, this is a very hard city to organize in and to find space to organize from. This is our reality, and therefore, more reasons to occupy. Because ultimately, no, this is a serious point though, ultimately, if we successfully were to take over a space and occupy it, then simply the threat of an occupation will make people listen to you. You see right now, we don't really have that many bargaining chips. The collective rights of unions, of, 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 of groups, has been eroded to such a point where it's just like the constant struggle, the cannibalism that it breeds. We need more tactics on the table so that even if you were to threaten to not shut down and continue the space and just not pay rent, that that would get people to listen to you. So I feel like introducing a mailing list and just getting all of your emails of all these beautiful faces and, and starting something you know here with everyone here tonight and taking it from there and helping to help defend spaces like Rhizome and also create more spaces in our society. The right to public space should be an essential right, you know? And that doesn't mean adhering to a bylaw that says you can't have political conversation or discussion after 10 p.m. in a park. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. Not at all. Really, when you, yeah, so not at all. So um, this illusion of freedom and all this stuff, we need to exercise these rights or else they're taken away from us permanently. So yeah, but thank you, thank you so much. Mailing list. Mailing list. I will. I will. I will put your paper in. If you're interested, please put your email. I'll grab on one. List. I'll grab one right now. And okay, I'll great, awesome. And so that brings us to a close, folks. Thank you so much to all of our panelists. <laughs> to everyone. <laughs> ways that you can um, participate in making sure that Rhizome survives these this crisis that we're currently in, all of us economically, is by becoming a friend of Rhizome. You can do that tonight by contributing one dollar to one bajillion dollars, whatever you have available to you and whatever you feel compelled to give. You can become a one-time donor. You can be a monthly donor. Um, so there are lots of ways to support. And I also want to just uh, keep people's attention to know that there's going to be a lot more stuff coming out from the Rhizome build, uh, Movement Building Center, and so please to um, yeah keep your eyes peeled and uh, if you're willing, give us your email addresses so we can make you. Oh, we're going to bring it to the front here, maybe. We'll bring the list to the front, and then we can keep you tuned to everything that we are planning to do. Thank you for all the wisdom that everybody brought into the space tonight. What an amazingly, incredibly inspiring discussion. So much history, so much present, so much future. So thank you all. Take care.
sorry, one more announcement. For anyone interested, Stephen Harper, Quincy Clark, and all their cronies are going to come to Science World tomorrow at 12 p.m. and occupy Vancouver. He's uh, planning to occupy this photo op. And so we invite everyone to come if they can tomorrow at noon at Science World. Woo! Thank you.